You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. Welcome back to our ongoing series of content here from the Options Industry Conference 2024 coming to you from scenic and sunny. I can confirm sunny this time because I did just come back from the lunch. My few minutes of allotted outdoor time when I'm not talking to people here in this room. So Asheville, very sunny this time of year, which was nice. Uh, But of course, it is the annual Options Industry Conference. It's our opportunity not just to take all the panel audio for you folks. So all of you out there who missed the conference can uh, check it out, but also to catch up with a wide variety of people from the world of options, talk about the hot button issues facing the options market today. And next up in the hot seat, our old friend, Mr. Sean Feeney, the head of U.S. options over there at NASDAQ. Sean, welcome back to the Options Insider Radio Network. Mark, thank you very much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. The OIC puts on an amazing conference each year and this year is no different. Sunny Asheville, it <laughs> is around 75 degrees today, and we are having a wonderful set of discussions across multiple segments within the industry and having a wonderful time doing it. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. We do. We do. On that note, as we were coming down to the show this year, so last week, we polled our audience. We said, you know, a lot of things going on in the world of options. What would you like us to talk about? What is top of mind for you? And two issues immediately rose to the fore. I'll let you, I've been playing this game with everybody this week. What do you think those two issues are, Sean? Gosh, I'm going to guess the rise in shorter dated options trading being one of them. You've been in the space for a little bit. And when are we listing options on a spot Bitcoin ETF? That was up there. That was a write-in. The actual number two was the cold 24-hour trading debate that's kind of going on right now as well. Uh, But yes, the, the Bitcoin options also popular. So we'll get to all that fun and a whole bunch more. Let's start I don't think you and I have talked officially on the record about this topic. So let's start there with the whole zero day. And I know before you say anything, I know there's short duration, short term options because they're not all listed the same. I understand that. But the uh, I've, I've had this conversation many times already this week. But I think the genie is out of the bottle. They're going to be called zero day whether we want it or not. So this whole zero day phenomenon we have going on. It's still contentious even with our audience. Whenever we poll our audience, they're roughly 50-50 on whether they like them or not industry event like this, it's similar. You see people on both sides of the fence. You've been on space for a bit. Where do you fall on the whole zero day phenomenon? Are they you know, a great tool or are they maybe uh, you know, these lurking gamma bombs waiting to go off at any moment? Well, first I'll provide you with a bit of data. When we did a, our initial research into same day expiring options trading, we took a look at the Magnificent Seven and the weekly options traded on the Friday expiring option contract going back to 2016. And we noted that on that expiring day of options trading, that 40% of the volume of that day's trading was in the expiring contract. So if you look at the rise in the phenomenon of zero-day options trading, as you put it, which I would 
reterm to shorter dated options trading or same day expiring options, that meta has not changed. So if in the Magnificent Seven and the most active single stock names, they're trading 40% on the date of expiry, then as additional expiries have been added to the most popular instruments in the industry, then that 40% number has really maintained consistency, maybe a little bit of a rise, depending upon the instrument, you know, the NDX and QQQ con, uh, the, the NDX and QQQ complexes are probably right around the 50% level at this point, and then the SPX complex with SPY probably in the mid to lower 40s, and then now with the introduction of Tuesday and Thursdays in IWM that NASDAQ listed two weeks ago after a filing process with the Securities and Exchange Commission, we expect to see an increase in on that side as well. So you know, we definitely see these instruments being traded, but it hasn't really shifted too much based upon an increase in trading these quote-unquote zero-day options. You know, these instruments are highly volatile. There is a lot of theta decay as we move towards expiry. So there is a bit of pricing disparity. We have seen both retail and institutional investors alike avail themselves with increased demand for these products. And when we think about these products, we tend to think that in the ETF landscape, adding this continuity of product adds an additional level of granularity for hedging there is opportunity for speculation, as there has been with options since July 31st of 1973, which was the first quote-unquote zero DTE event. That was the first expired option. I think there were some Xerox July 31st, 160 calls that ended up expiring on that day. If I'm not mistaken, it was four years before I was born. So yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say that I have active and working knowledge of that experience. But when we look at our data, we see a maintained consistency, a balanced trading profile in these instruments. And when we get asked if these instruments add any additional systemic risk into the marketplace, the data tells us no. Is there opportunity for one side or another side to be stacked and create some semblance of a gamma bomb? There is that possibility in any series, in any product, at any time. And will, will that happen? Does that happen? Very likely not. The industry at large, when there is a significant disparity in realized versus implied volatility, course corrects. That's what liquidity providers are for. You know, they are there to absorb the you know, adverse selection bias of demand, and they are the supply side of this industry, and they've done an amazing job at absorbing the risk of these instruments on both sides of the market, as well as tightening spreads, allowing for lower notional dollar either speculation or you know, increased disparity between implied and realized volatility profiles could yield to additional yield enhancement. And then there's always a very difficult time for professionals to price these options as they approach expiration. And I wouldn't say very difficult because we've been you know, experiencing this for over 50 years in the options industry and gotten fairly good at it. But understanding the risk profile of these options is key for investors as well as professionals alike who are trading these options and every day and providing liquidity on a balanced basis. It's interesting because we've been talking now here. It's been almost exactly two years, like two years and I think two weeks since this whole Again, call it whatever you want. Short dated phenomenon really kicked off in earnest. And this time, two years ago at the conference, no one was talking about this. I think we might have brought it up in passing, but it wasn't the dominant discussion point the way it is now. A lot of people were surprised by that. Sounds like you weren't that surprised that these products have kind of taken off. To your analysis, they're kind of just slotting in the way they've always performed, just maybe on a larger and more regular scale. Entirely agreed. In fact, last year on my panel at the Options Industry Conference, I stated very clearly that zero DTE in itself is not a product. You know, it is a phenomenon that has been in existence since the beginning of options trading when you have an, an 
instrument that has an expiration date, there tends to be a larger amount of interest around that expiry. And then as new product continues to be inserted into the market based upon demand for that product, the marketplace will react efficiently, effectively, and responsibly. You know, it's funny, as an old SBX guy, uh, we used to flee from expiration. We, we would always, we were trained to take off everything we could, roll it whenever possible. You know, if you had a vestigial eight lot lying around on some strike, you know, bug the broker, close it out. So you had nothing going into that final day that could pose some sort of bizarre, unforeseen risk. And yet now the notion that fully half of the market is rushing to that, to embrace that on a daily basis. It's still, even though I know the data says otherwise, it still to me is hard to wrap my head around that. But that, that is the environment we find ourselves in now, Sean. Speaking of that environment, you mentioned zero day, the popularity earlier when you're guessing the poll. The other question we received from everyone is, okay, we like the zero day, but what else you got? You know, we like the indexes, we like some of the ETFs, but where's my Tesla? Where's my, you know, NVIDIA? Pick your name of choice out there. We've heard a lot of talk this week about what's going on there, what is actually uh, gumming up the work. So then my first question to you would be, what is the main impediment that you foresee that is, that is holding this up? And then B, the question everyone's asking us, so I will put it to you, is when do you think we can reasonably expect to see an NVIDIA and, and also what format would that be? A limited pilot? Something else? What are you seeing coming down the pike? When it comes to single stocks and options on single stocks, the industry has certain risk elements and educational challenges as well as operational challenges in order to list non-Friday expiring options in individual names. These names tend to have corporate action events that happen on a post-close basis during a period which we would like to call the contrary exercise intent window notification, notification window. And that is between 4, 4 p.m. Eastern and 5.30 p.m. Eastern time, you know, or 3, because you're a Chicago guy, 3 p.m. Central or 4.30 Central. And that is the period where any participant with a long position in an option may exercise an option out of the money or instruct their clearing firm or broker to not exercise an option that may be in the money if they are long. So when there exists that ability to exercise on a post-close basis based upon an after-hours move, then there could be additional risk because every option that is exercised is subsequently assigned. And whoever is short that option assumes additional risk that they may not be aware of during that period. So the industry is reticent to really list Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays in single stocks based on the potential for after-hours news events to be disruptive to the retail community. And if the industry is to move forward and list these, uh, these non-Friday expiring options, there are certain considerations that would need to be made, as well as an educational effort on that side. There are also some institutional use cases and some clearing firm operational elements. And then if you're a market maker, having a multitude of positions and then some movement after hours could cause you to exercise an option that is you know, out of the money or end up being assigned on an option that happens to be in the money. And then, and then having to hedge those risks as a professional could, could also pose some challenges. So last month, we all sat down as far as the listed options market structure working group down in Dallas, and we talked about a lot of the issues surrounding the potential listing of single stock non-Friday expiring options. And you know, there are some ways to mitigate a lot of those risks. You could decrease the number of securities where that would be a concern if there was a limited number of securities, say the top five so or ten names, pilot or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So, and 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 pilots or or otherwise style of programs you know, could be initiated. And then from an exchange perspective, what we would be able to do if the industry decided that it was prudent and the SEC agreed that these would be suitable instruments for the, for the investor base, we could limit the amount of strikes that we would list around the at-the-money or make sure that there is a certain minimum 
breadth of strike density, meaning you know, the distance between these strikes, right? So there has been a lot of chat and talk about strike density specific to scenarios like, well, NVIDIA is $875, why do we need the 877 and a half strike? Right, so the industry needs to understand that we want to manage capacity, manage the amount of data that's being broadcast across 17 options exchanges and all of the participants and all of the different exchanges themselves and all of the risk that comes with having to quote as a market maker up to 1.5 million instruments, you know, ensuring at a time, on a real-time basis, as things are moving in a vol in volatile environments or non-volatile environments, you know, just ensuring that we understand all of the risk profiles, not only to the end user customer, but also to the industry itself and making sure that everyone is protected and that the most reasonably suitable and demand-driven tradable instruments are listed. That doesn't mean that we're not going to list them. It means that we're gathering data, we're having conversations as an industry, and we're looking to really try to come to terms in a happy medium, medium with how we list these products. We've heard a lot of debate this week about uh, when they think that will shape up. It sounds like from your conversations, they're still, they're still in the early offing. So would you think this year is even beyond the framework or something that could happen, some sort of limited pilot, as you mentioned, even let's say by the end of this year? There's wood to chop and I would not be so bold as to opine on when. I don't believe that they will end up being listed at any point during the 2024 calendar year. But that's just knowing that in order to list these products, we would need to submit a filing or one exchange would need to submit a filing to the Securities and Exchange Commission. And then that filing would have a minimum shelf life of 45 days with a commentary period, which is available to the public so that anyone can weigh in. And then in the event that the SEC would not reach a decision over 45 days, they could extend that another 45 days and then potentially institute proceedings, which would be a further 90-day extension, and then could delay that proceedings another an additional 60 days, which is a, a total of 240 days from the initial filing itself, if the commission needed to, to weigh in on more time. And, and DIRA at the commis commission, the D Department of Economic Research, there would make some determination and then would relay into the office of yeah, the Department of Trading and Markets, and then Trading and Markets would then ultimately approve or disapprove a, a filing in that regard. So, you know, even if the exchange, an exchange were to list, it would still have to go through a regulatory process, uh, and I don't believe that that process would end up. Uh, in a listing of a product in the calendar year 2024. One more before we roll off of the whole zero day or short duration, whatever, short term, let's call them, short term option phenomenon out there. We have a lot of professional users out there, institutional listeners out there in the audience. And a lot of them have been writing and asking us lately, you know, what are we seeing on the institutional front? What is the impact we're seeing? Because obviously, 50% of SPX, that's not just your grandmother in Iowa, that's big funds and others adopting these products as well. So people are very curious as to the use cases out there and also if that's impacting or maybe reshaping the institutional landscape at all where maybe it's changing how they're structuring some of these trades going forward. You obviously watch a lot of the flow out there and the institutions as well. But what are you seeing on that front? Institutions can use these products and the continuity that's built within these products as an advantage for them to be able to more granularly hedge their risk profile, and oftentimes they are using these instruments in that fashion. There are also times where institutions could be net sellers of these options in order to perform enhanced yield creation through collecting additional premium given the enhanced acceleration of the DK profile on the last day of expiry. So there are use cases that are out there that are being that they're being performed by the institutional community. And then there are also use cases on the retail side where there, if you look at how these instruments are being traded, a large percentage of them are being traded in multi-leg options that have a limited risk exposure. And then again, we still do have that 
post-close scenario where something could happen after the close and things could move. And the retail firms have also done an amazing job at implementing real-time risk management practices to proactively close positions which may be at risk for underfunding or scenarios where there's too much risk being employed into a single account. And that has been very helpful in maintaining the demand throughout this cycle. These instruments are incredibly powerful. And you can use these instruments in whichever manner you wish to use them as either a retail or institutional investor. And there are more use cases that are being brought every day into the landscape. And we see different strategies, whether they be single leg or multi leg, that are being employed using these shorter dated instruments. And ultimately, it's bringing more awareness to the industry and more awareness to the power of these products in order to optimize to your financial objectives within a portfolio. And if you were to ask me, good or bad, are the shorter dated options and the increase in trading in these shorter dated options a good thing or a bad thing for the industry, I would say that I'm neutral to slightly positive on them. Speaking of instruments, uh, I can't remember the last time I talked this much about Flex. <laughs> it seems like everyone coming through here this week has been super excited about all things Flex. If I had to come up with a sub-theme for this year outside of at least the conference, outside of Zero Day and everything else, it would be the year of Flex. Probably in the last decade, I probably talked about it three times. And now and just in the last week, it's, it's been dominating the conversation. So I'm curious uh, for you, Sean, you folks over there at NASDAQ, are you as giddy about flex as apparently every, everyone else is right now? And B, if so, why? What is so exciting about flex in the year 2024? Everyone is excited about flex and the increase in trading in these flex instruments. So what is a flex instrument? They are you know, non-standard options where you can define the strike price as well as the security and then the settlement style as well. So you can have European and American style options. The flexibility, no pun intended, that is provided by these instruments has become a significant use case as the assets under management to option embedded ETFs continues to rise. There's been a surge in popularity of ETFs with, uh, with embedded optionality, whether they be buffer products, buy right products, or any other style of complex actively managed or passively managed complex products with optionality to them. And you know, with the increase, and I believe the number is somewhere north of $150 billion of assets under management, the most efficient use case for performing these operations is through the utilization of flex instruments. And these flexed instruments have certain advantages over vanilla listed instruments in terms of how they close and how they settle and how they mark, whereas there isn't this mark-to-market concept, so whereas it's more marked to a much closer semblance to a fair value at the Options Clearing Corporation, so these flex instruments become quite a bit more popular. Uh, and there are other uh, use cases for flex instruments, especially in an increased interest rate environment. There's, you know, you, you mentioned the Euroflex, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, trades that could resemble some sort of a repo transaction or some sort of a reversal conversion in order to uh, to advantage towards the stock loan or securities lending side of the space and really kind of trade the rates market through the use of listed options, whether they be index options, equity options, or alike. And, you know, and there are also other use cases for flex in terms of merger and you know, mer merger scenarios or places where you would need long stock to tender and would you wish to convert and then have to tender your shares, you know, things, of, things of that nature. And then there are also great use cases for balance sheet management, hence that repo transaction. So I think it's fair to say then that Flex is going to be a big growth area and a big focus for NASDAQ this year and next year, probably. Well, we are in active development of an electronic Flex tool on the ISE exchange. We do have an active filing in with the Securities and Exchange Commission for approval of that. And then we're also looking to add Flex enhancements to our existing product on the Philadelphia Stock Exchange today. And we're looking to modernize those processes as we look to modernize all of our technology as new technology develops. And we continue to maintain the fact that we're innovators in this space and 
We wish to have the right place, right time, right technology in order to deploy into the marketplace so that we can best facilitate the efficient transfer of risk. Speaking of modernizing the markets, some of our listeners would argue that these modern markets are archaic because they have an opening and closing bell, which brings us to you know, the next hot subject that everyone wanted us to discuss this week. Brought up by your friends over there at NYSE, they did a poll, I believe, of their membership kind of kicked this off. SEC has been banding this about for a little bit as well, this whole notion of uh, should the underlying stock market go 24-7? We actually polled our audience on that, and you'd think, you know, very aggressive, option-savvy audience, they'd want it all trading 24-7. But no, actually, nearly 70%, 69.8% said no, they don't want it going to 24 hours a day. Only 30% saying yes. So that, that was interesting, I thought. Where do you fall on this uh, very contentious issue? And also, obviously, it will have an impact for options. So in what way do you think it makes sense for that to play out? How would extended hours or after hours options trading, how would that play out? Mark, we all need to sleep. So, sleep is clearly overrated, at least according to 30% of our audience. Yes. Well, hey, we, we do all need to sleep, and the markets also need to breathe. And having a 24-hour rolling all the time open market is a very difficult operational challenge. There, there are just operational challenges across the board there. That said, when we are looking into the expansion of trading hours and specifically to our proprietary product index suite, the NASDAQ 100, NDX, XND, you know, we are looking into some potential expansion. Is it going to look and feel like that which exists today with global trading hours elsewhere? We don't know yet. We're still sourcing some of the requirements there. And then there are certain elements of trading, like if you enter an order pre-market, when does a day order conclude? Is it a pre-market session? during the day, post-market session. So in order to ensure that we have a full suite functionality of available product with seamless straight-through processing, clearing, settlement, and, and be able to really efficiently transfer risk between counterparties, we need to ensure that there is a good liquidity landscape and the overall community seems amenable to the expansion of trading hours. In terms of 24-7, what do you think happens to the the liquidity profile during the active trading day if liquidity tends to be split across 24 hours versus six and a half? Yeah, and it's uh, not exactly a good experience. Anyone in the retail side can go look at the crypto experience on the weekends and the after hours if they want the most analogous, immediate, retail-friendly 24-7 experience. And I think a lot of people don't really enjoy that. So it would definitely be uh, something similar, or even what we see now, you know, in the after hours, just for stocks, you know, and during earnings announcements and others, were not exactly the most liquid experience. The underlying vacillating around. So yeah, this is definitely a, an example of you know, careful what you wish for. Sometimes, if sometimes people see it, especially this time of year during earnings season, they see a big move in whatever name X Y Z, and they think, oh, I wish I could capture that with options, and it makes sense. It's an understandable sentiment. I certainly understand it. But uh, you're right. Some of the other underpinnings that might go along with that, they may end up thinking, (laughs) maybe I shouldn't have wished for this uh, in the long run out there. It's funny, it goes back to the theme I was saying earlier too, about everything old being new again. Flex, very much on the docket this year. And also, I stopped talking about after hours options trading, I think about five years ago, because it seemed like there was no no movement there and no interest in moving it. So it was kind of a dead issue. So I stopped talking about it. And all of a sudden, last couple of weeks, it, it is back on the radar. So that's another theme for the conference this year. Everything old is new again out there. Another thing that's been consuming our audience these days. It's been a big talking point really since obviously the pandemic kicked off this new volume regime we've all been living in. You know, we see it anecdotally here on the network with, you know, an influx of new listeners all the time, uh, which we love. We love to see that. And a lot of that driven by them discovering the options market on an almost daily basis. So we've seen almost exponential growth pretty much year after year, month after month. This last March was one of the first real hiccups we've seen in that, down about 10%. Now, obviously, last March was the contagion period, so it's not quite an apples-to-apples apples comparisons, but still, it got some people thinking, oh, maybe is, is this it? Is this the apex for volume? Is it plateauing now? Have we kind of reached the level where we're going to be hanging out for a while, or maybe is it going to start trending down, or perhaps 
it's the it's the pause, it's the breath before the next aggressive leg up. Obviously, you see a lot of volume over there at Nasdaq. What are your thoughts on what we just saw in March, and maybe what does that portend for the future from an options volume perspective? Well, in March, on a year over year basis, sure we were down a bit from a volume perspective, but then take a look at April and we were up year over year from a volume perspective. So it really is going to be case by case. And that's true. I've been so busy in this room. I have not looked at the numbers for April yet. So I'll have to go check those out after this. (laughs) Yeah, it was, we're, we're going to have ebbs and flows with market volatility. It's not going to be a one way up on the overall industry volumes. And we have had a lot of new interest since 2019 in this industry. And that was the move to zero commission scenarios on the equity side, limited commission scenarios on the option side. The meme stock era really really precipitated a ton of volume. And then those new participants, as they learned how to effectively manage their risk and maintain profitability utilizing derivative instruments, the increase in volume has continued, and the market has also cooperated as well. So as new money ends up coming into the market, do we see new participants and options? Absolutely. And you know, if we have a larger downdraft in the market, will we see a washout of participants? Possibly. You know, do, will, uh, will volume ebb and flow as volatility ebbs and flows? Also, yes. So we're, we're going down the road and continuing to provide the education to the retail investor, the education to the new investor on how to responsibly use these products in order to attain their investment objectives. And options are an incredible product. And we've been pitching this for 25 years. When we were doing 25 years ago, we were doing 2 million contracts a day. And now we're doing over 40. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing very well at providing investors, institutional and retail alike, with the education as to where they can utilize these powerful instruments in order to get what they need to get done. When I asked you earlier about what you thought the hot topics would be, you mentioned the Bitcoin ETF options. That was a popular write-in with a lot of our listeners. Uh, It sounds like from talking to people this week, maybe they should pump the brakes on their enthusiasm for that a little bit. But what are you hearing behind the scenes? What are your thoughts on, on whether folks can expect these this year or maybe even ever? Well, I mentioned the filing process a little <laughs> bit earlier when it comes to the non-Friday expiring options and single stocks. And that same process would have to happen specific to any options on any new product suite. So in order to list options on the spot Bitcoin ETFs, you need to go through the regulatory rigmarole in order to get these things accomplished. And given that Bitcoin is classified as a commodity, now you have multiple regulators who are involved in this process. So it's not only an SEC decision on suitability and making sure that these products are safe for investors and they're carefully considering all of the issues and there's been multiple comment letters that have been entered into a lot of these filings which you can go and read online and see how you know sure would options help to hedge these instruments yes but that's not the only thing that regulators need to you know, need to really ascertain about an individual product suite. You know, would there be a use case? Yes. But uh, are they suitable? They need to do the research, make sure that they have the right data, and then ultimately make a decision. And after the SEC would need to weigh in, then there are other concerns that need to that need to happen at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in order to either in order to allow for the options clearing corporation to clear and settle these options. So there needs to be collaboration among the regulator regulation community, and then the industry needs to be prepared to deploy these options and then help people manage their risk effic- efficiently and effectively, as with any other instrument. Well, Sean, I appreciate you taking some time out of your conference to join us to chat with our listeners about the pressing issues of the day in the world of options and how everything old is new again and exciting again out here. But before we go, we'd like to leave our audience 
wanting more. So if there's anything interesting up your sleeve, what you and the team are working on, maybe something our audience can look forward to coming down the pike from the folks over there at NASDAQ Options. Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Well, last year we introduced Wednesday expiring options in five ETFs, specifically GLD, SLV, TLT, UNG, and USO in alphabetical order. We will be filing with the SEC very likely tomorrow to list Monday expiring options on those instruments. And we do believe that the insertion of Wednesdays into these complexes has been a net positive for the industry. We have seen some volume accretion. We have seen an actual decrease in the overall realized volatility in the last 30 minutes of the trading day around the close. Yeah, these, these instruments are being used responsibly. And then I cannot impress enough that in the appropriate instances, providing the correct continuity of product is a net positive for any product, whether that be an ETF or we'll let everybody else decide on the single stock side of things. I'm not going to take a position either way there. Uh, but when it comes to being able to trade, manage risk, speculate, yield scalp, any options strategy, create you know, some sort of a complex strategy, these incre- the increased amount of expirations has so far been a net positive without any additional systemic risk. So we'll continue to monitor the data. We'll continue to list new product when and where appropriate. Uh, And we will be back, likely to talk about some more hot button topics (laughs) in the very near future. And it has been an absolute pleasure as always. And the, uh, the options industry conference is very full of content this year. So we'll likely be talking about a host of other topics even. Yes, who knows what, uh, what old topic will be new again when we talk again <laughs> next year. But I appreciate it, Sean. We'll look forward to seeing how all these initiatives unfold in the marketplace in the coming months. Thanks for having me. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.